This is my latest project, the Urchin. It's a 34 key keyboard based on the sweep. I decided to make it because I wanted to add the nice view screens to my wireless sweep, which unfortunately doesn't support them. I made this keyboard specifically for wireless use, so it only supports ZMK and doesn't have a cable to connect the two sides. Everything is connected wirelessly and runs on lithium batteries. By the way, the screens use a technology called sharp memory, which is a hybrid between a regular LCD and an e-paper display. The benefit is that they have a pretty high refresh rate at 30 Hz, but still consume very little current. So the impact on battery life is almost zero. Since you guys always want to know the price, let me warn you that this is an expensive build. Just the nice nanos together with the two screens come close to $100. So for the complete build, I estimated around $180 without shipping. I also need to give a couple of warnings. This build is not meant for beginners, so if it's your first custom keyboard, I recommend starting from a sweep instead, which is both cheaper and easier to build. You will be able to reuse parts on this keyboard if you decide to upgrade later. This guide is meant only for the Urchin keyboard. I do not recommend using it for similar projects. Before moving on to the actual build, let me take a moment to thank PCBWay, which were kind enough to make the PCBs for me for free. They have an online quote page where you can upload the Gerber file that I'll leave for you in the video description. Once you do so, you'll be able to change all of the settings you want about the PCB, but it actually detects the best settings automatically for you. I only recommend changing the PCB color to match your preference, and that's it. After placing the order, one of their engineers will check that everything is correct and they will produce the PCBs and ship them to you in just a few days. This is how the PCB looks like. Before beginning with the build, let's separate the two parts by snapping the middle section. I will only show how to build the right hand side. To build the other, you just need to repeat the exact same steps. I suggest to start with the diodes because it's easier to go from the smallest component to the largest. I'm going to set my iron temperature between 320 and 330 degrees Celsius, but you can vary this depending on your iron and solder setup. For all of the surface mount components, I'm going to first add solder to one of the pads, then add the component. I find that doing it in this order makes it a little easier. Also, to make the build a bit faster, I'm going to do all of the first pads at once before soldering anything to the PCB. This is how the diode pads should look like, but I'll give you a better look in just a moment. First, like I said, I'm going to do the same thing for all of the hot swap sockets. And this is how it looks like after I added solder to one pad of every socket. Now we can begin mounting the diodes to the PCB. It's important to put them in the correct direction. You will see a line marked on the diode. This line must be on the same side as the line on the PCB. This is the line you're looking for. You need to align the line on this symbol with the line on the diode. The surface mount diodes can be a bit tricky to install, so some patience will be needed for this step. It's not hard, but you need to give yourself the time it takes to do it. All you need to do is align the diode on the two pads and hold it in place. Then heat up the solder that we previously applied and let the diode sink in place. This is how it should look like. It's not important to have them perfectly straight as long as the metal parts of the diode are on top of each of the copper pads. After all of the diodes are on the PCB, proceed by soldering the second pad on each of them. By the way, for pads this small, I recommend to use between 0.5 to 0.6 mm wire if possible. I'm not going to show soldering all of them because it would look very repetitive. When you are done, this is how every diode should look like. Next up, we are going to solder the reset button, which goes on the top side of the PCB. The technique is the same as for the diodes, so we are first going to add solder to one of the pads. Then place the button on the PCB and heat the solder to attach it. Make sure to align it properly before soldering the second pad, and feel free to reheat the pad if you wish to adjust the alignment. When you're finally happy with how it looks, you can solder the second pad.
Here is a close-up shot of what mine looks like. Now we can move on to the power switch, and don't worry, I haven't forgotten about the hot swap sockets, those will be the next step. I started by adding solder to two of the lateral pads, but you can do only one if you find it easier. The four lateral pads are just to provide stability to the switch, since you will be applying some force to it when you use it. While the lower three pads are connected electrically to the batteries and the microcontroller. After adding solder to all of its pads, this will be the final result. And now we are finally ready to add the hot swap sockets. This is probably the easiest part of the build, so I'm not going to spend too much time going over it. Let's jump to the final result. This is how the PCB looks like with all of the sockets installed. The technique I used is the same as for the previous components. Just heat up the solder on the first pad to attach it to the PCB, and then add solder to the second pad. Now we can move on to the microcontroller. I will be reusing the same nice nano that I was using on my Sweep V2. I'm able to easily remove it since it was socketed using female headers and Milmax machined pins. I highly recommend you to do the same for your microcontrollers, so you don't end up wasting them if you want to change your keyboard. I'll leave a link for them in the video description. It will be really hard to remove the microcontroller from a PCB if you just use the included male headers and there is a very high risk of damaging it if you try to do so. Right now I'm adding new female headers on it, so when I solder it to the PCB everything will be aligned nicely. This also helps in lowering the cost of the build, since I'm reusing old parts. You can find 12 pin headers online, but buying longer headers and cutting them down as needed also helps reduce costs. The first pin is the most important because it will determine whether the others will be aligned properly or not, so make sure to apply some pressure so that the headers lay flush to the PCB while you're soldering the first pin. After all of the pins are soldered, this is how it looks. And finally, we get to the best part of the whole build, which is of course the screen. Since it's my first time soldering one of these, I started with a test fit. Luckily, everything fit together as expected, so I decided to begin soldering the header. I tried pre-soldering one of the holes and pushing the header through it while hitting it, but that ended up being a bad idea. For some reason I wasn't able to push it through, so I decided to undo this step and try a different approach. This time I'm going to insert the header and then solder the first pin to hold it still. Now the alignment is really bad, but it's easy to fix by heating up the solder and pushing it straight. Now it's much better, but notice how the plastic part isn't touching the PCB. This is normal, a small gap will remain between the PCB and the header. Finally, we can solder the display. Be careful during this step, because it's quite delicate. Looking back, I would recommend putting some tape on the screen while you work on it, to avoid any accidental damage from small splashes of solder or flux. While soldering one of the pins of the screen, it changed its color and looked like it was glitching out. This surprised me, but the screen didn't suffer any permanent damage and is working just fine. Anyway, like with all delicate parts, try to avoid stressing it with too much heat. I got a bit carried away, but don't forget to finish the header pins as well. 
After installing the keycaps and switches, you can already test the keyboard to check if everything is working, but you need to finish both sides and connect them to your PC with two USB cables. If you don't have your own firmware yet, you can use mine for testing. I'll leave a link in the description to that as well. In case you're wondering, I'm using chalk silver switches and LDSA blank keycaps. I think these are the best available keycaps for ergonomic low-profile keyboards because of the thumb keys, which are really comfortable. Now there is nothing left to do except to add the battery, so I'm going to remove the display and the microcontroller to get better access to the battery pads. Try to pry evenly from both directions to avoid bending the Milmax pins. I find it easiest to first fill the two holes with some solder and then melt it while you push the cable into it. This way you don't have to do too many things at once and you can avoid stressing the battery cables with heat. Usually the black cable is the negative and the red one is the positive, but always check first with a multimeter if possible. Now gently twist the wires and position the battery. And finally, reassemble everything together and you're good to go. Thank you for watching till the end and I'll see you in the next video.